Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Hello, Rhonda. <laughs> I can't even say hello. <laughs> hello, David, and welcome everyone to episode 203. This is our eighth in this, our series on the Cognitive Disorder Distortion Starter Kit, and today we're talking about emotional reasoning. Yeah, we got it all out. Great, great. I think you have a beautiful email about our beloved Marilyn. Some of you newer podcast listeners may not recall, but Podcast 49, uh, Matt May and I worked uh, with in a series of sessions. It was just one session, but it was broken up into little pieces with our beloved colleague, uh, Marilyn Coffey, who had just been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer several days earlier. And she came into the session filled with despair. Her anxiety and depression were 100. Her anger and rage were 100. And it, it was a beautiful example, not only of how it's not the events. Uh, we had a recording on this just recently. Uh, Rhonda, you raised the question, events cannot upset us directly. Only our thoughts can upset us. And, uh, and she was uh, beating up on herself because she thought she had lost her religious faith and, 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 and that she should not do that. And it was a very moving session with, with Matt, who's just a fabulous therapist and beautiful human being. And uh, we, we resolved her, with her help, her depression entirely. She went from sobbing and rage to uncontrollable laughter during the session. And it also made the point that you can change how you feel very rapidly, often, using the team uh, therapy techniques. So let's hear the, the letter, because a lot of people have been inspired by, by Marilyn, particularly she thought it was wrong to lose her religious faith, and this turned out to be so inspiring to so many listeners who were struggling with the same issue. Right, because we also did a follow-up, which was episode 159 with Marilyn. So we, you did those in the beginning, which were in the 40s, and then episode 159 was a follow-up. Yep. Right. Yep. So people can turn to those episodes if they want to hear all of them. So here, here someone must have recently listened to them and wrote, Hello, Dr. Burns in Maryland. Maryland, I can't thank you enough for being so generous and sharing your story and experience with us. I feel so close to you and it broke my heart when I heard you talk about your diagnosis, the procedures, and the surgery you described. I was also deeply inspired and touched. The first time I listened to the episodes of your sessions with Dr. Burns and Dr. May, I was going through a difficult time with a close family member, and I was questioning my faith, which in turn made me feel guilty and inadequate. At one point in the methods section, you said, if you're questioning your spirituality, it's because you're a spiritual person. That warmed my heart and made me feel even closer to you. It also sealed my belief that questioning God and religious teachings is a component of any profound spiritual journey. I'm also in, in awe of how much you've accomplished, both as a person and as a professional. And I felt so humbled. You see, I've been struggling with anxiety and depression since I was a teen, and I have had a lot of shame about my mental health challenges. During my training as a psychologist and after, I struggled with the thought that I should not be depressed and anxious and that I should be able to cure myself. The fact that I was unable to accomplish, meant, accomplish that meant I was a bad therapist, that I was unworthy of being a psychologist and of being trusted with another person's mental health. I also felt ashamed at the idea of getting professional help. When I listened to the podcast episodes, I thought, if someone who is as accomplished, educated, and talented as Marilyn can be vulnerable and get help, surely I can as well. You encouraged me to do my own personal work, Marilyn, and I'm so grateful. It changed my life and that of my husband and family. I'm excited at the thought that your experience has and will change and save so many more lives. Marilyn, 
I want to ask how you're doing right now. And Dr. Burns, I'm full of admiration for you, and I'm grateful for all the help and humanness that you so generously offer. Warmly, Audrey. Well, thank you so much for that beautiful uh, email, and I'll uh, certainly uh, forward that to Marilyn. I know she'll appreciate it uh, greatly. And one of the biblical statements that comes to mind, I, I'm not real religious uh, to say the least, but I, I think that uh, spirituality is important. And there's, I remember there was one of the early Christian uh, saints or whatever they were, and, but I, he had some kind of uh, weakness. Uh, some people think it was maybe he had homosexuality, which was frowned on or maybe stuttering or maybe manic, manic depressive illness. And he kept praying to God, uh, the Holy Spirit, to heal, heal him. And his prayers kept getting ignored. And then finally, the Holy Spirit came to him. And this probably sounds terribly corny, particularly if you're not religious, but there's beautiful meaning in it. The Holy, it says the Holy Spirit came, came to him and said, uh, my grace is sufficient for you, for in your suffering, uh, for in your weakness, my his strength is revealed more completely. You know, like in, in your suffering, in your weakness, his strength is revealed more co completely. And, you know, both Marilyn showed that and then Audrey, who wrote that email, sh showed that, that when you share your vulnerability, and you've shown that too, Rhonda, uh, that when you show your weakness, the part of yourself that you've been trying to hide, and you share that with, with dignity, it touches uh, so so many people. It's kind of like like a miracle. Uh, so thank thank you for that beautiful beautiful note. And and all of you, we we're just I, we, I got many many uh, beautiful emails uh, pretty much every day with kind and wonderful and encouraging things to say. Thank you all of uh, all of you too who have been supporting us. We we seem to be uh, increasing in numbers in the podcast. Last month was 123,000, which was way better than any previous month. And yesterday was our biggest one day ever. And th this month will it looks if it keeps up, it'll go over 130, maybe approaching you know above 135,000 downloads. So please keep telling your friends if you know people who are are, are depressed or anxious or struggling. Maybe they're in therapy and, they're, and nothing's changing, or maybe they're afraid to go to therapy. Tell, tell them about the Feeling Good podcast and my website, feelinggood.com, because there's tons of free resources, and a lot of people are, are, are helped just by listening to, 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 to the podcast. And also my new book, Feeling Great, is available now for pre-order on amazon.com, and it'll be officially released on in the middle, I think, September 15th, and if you pre-order it. This will help it achieve some maybe quasi-bestseller status uh, we're hoping for on the day that it's it's released. So, but thank you all. We just, we love you all. Uh, we're, we're grateful for this chance to communicate with so many of you in such a positive way. Today's topic is, is a, a, a huge one, uh, emotional uh, reasoning. Uh, what, what is, uh, should we dive in? Yeah, let's um, dive in. Yeah, what, what is, should we define emotional reasoning? Yeah, let's it's one define the, emotional reasoning. It's, it's one of the 10 cognitive distortions, and it's a name I coined. Is this what you, no one, did, you did you coin this, not Beck or Ellis? Yeah, that's, that's correct. I don't think it had, had it ever been thought of as, a, as an entity before I, before I uh, added that and created the name and, and the concept, but it, it's, it's hugely important and 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 you know we we've been told for you know a generation that uh, the key to mental health is to share your feelings and like all statements it, it's both true and false at, at the same time what what's true about it is it, it's great as a form of intimacy to be genuine and open with people that's some things you've done on the show live uh, Rhonda and it's and Marilyn did. It's, it's been incredibly helpful to people, but at the same time, sharing your feelings is, is clearly not not the uh, the road to mental health. When I was a psychiatric resident, all we had people do was express their feelings, and they'd come and sob and be angry and 
tell me that their life was screwed up and I wasn't helping them and that they were angry and hopeless and and I wasn't allowed to do anything except encourage them to to share more feelings and uh, they, they sure shared their feelings and my <laughs> supervisors thought it was they said oh it's great therapy you're doing they're getting all this uh, you know repressed anger out but it never did any good. I, none of those patients ever recovered. None of them that I can recall even improved uh, slightly from all that venting of feelings. Well, wouldn't you say that sharing your feelings is a necessary part of therapy, but it's not sufficient to get to get to the place of a healing yeah. state? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's necessary, but it it doesn't do much of anything uh, really to to cure people of uh, of anything. Uh, the uh, uh, and so emotional reasoning, it, it comes from the place that, that reasoning from how you feel can be incredibly misleading. And just tuning into your feelings, it, it, you know, it, it may just may make you, you worse in a way because your, your feelings are created by your thoughts entirely, 100%. And, and if the thoughts are distorted, like if you're telling yourself, I'm a, a worthless human being or I'm hopeless and, and things will never change, then you're going to feel worthless or you're going to feel hopeless. But those feelings are very misleading because they don't prove that you are worthless or that you are hopeless. They're extremely distorted. They're no more valid than than the images in funhouse mirrors, these distorted wavy mirrors that make you look too large or too small or too tall or too short or too weird. And and so emotional reasoning means not, not to be reasoning always from your emotions and taking your emotions as, as proof of something. And here are some examples that uh, Jill Levitt and I mentioned in our recent workshop on the 10 cognitive distortions. These are examples of emotional reasoning. I feel like a loser, so I must really be a loser. And a lot of depressed people reason like that. I feel hopeless. I feel totally hopeless. I feel like things can never change for me, so I must be hopeless. Or I feel anxious, I'm scared, I must be in danger. Otherwise I wouldn't be feeling so frightened. Or I feel like a bad therapist or a bad mom or a bad dad, so I must really be one. I feel judged. This means that people are judging me and looking down on me. Does it? I feel guilty, this means I'm bad or this means I, I did something bad. Uh, and and, and the reason I call it a cognitive distortion is because those feelings reinforce distorted thoughts and, 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 and they do not put you in touch with reality. Hmm. And I have, a, I have a harder time with, I have a, one part of this uh, that I have a hard time with. And I know we're not talking about labeling today where you, you call yourself a, a name and, and that's the distortion, but sometimes I get confused between labeling and emotional reasoning. So you're saying, I feel like a loser, that's emotional reasoning, but you could also say, I'm a loser, which would be a label. And what's the difference? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. A lot of these distortions are kind of uh, interwoven. They're in interconnected in different ways. Uh, but one way to think about it is, let, let's say you label yourself. Did, did you say a loser? Yes. Was that what you said? Right. Uh, if you label yourself, that's a thought. Uh, that's a labeling thought. I, I'm a loser. That thought causes you to feel horrible. You feel worthless, inadequate. You start thinking about all of your, your flaws. And so you feel like a loser. And then you say, wow, I feel like a worthless human being. I must be a loser. Uh, do, you, do you see the emotional reasoning? I did a study on the Stanford inpatient unit in the, in the da daily cognitive therapy groups. And we, the, the data showed, what, I tried to solve this chicken versus the egg problem. What comes first, the negative thought or the negative emotions? You know, do negative emotions cause distorted thoughts or distorted thoughts cause negative emotions? And I did this thing called uh, circular causal mod modeling. And the, the data showed that both are true. Negative thoughts cause negative emotions. There was a massive causal effect that I confirmed in that study. 
But at the same time, once you get upset through this process of emotional reasoning, that fires up more neg ne negative nerve circuits in your brain. And, and so it tr that triggers more distorted negative thoughts. So they, they kind of uh, e uh, uh, cause each other in, in a, vicious, a vicious cycle. The cool thing is that uh, positive thoughts generate, if you believe them, positive feelings, which then generate more positive thoughts. So you can have a positive uh, upward spiral or a, or a negative uh, downward, downward sp spiral, but your emotions will definitely uh, re reinforce reinforce your your thoughts. Now, to give an example of this, uh, uh, yeah, I used to have my Sunday hikes, and we hope we can get them going again. People are asking for them again, uh, but but I think it's still t too dangerous because I don't want to go out there and you know pick up somebody's COVID uh, vi virus and die. Uh, <laughs> well, we don't want that either. <laughs> Yeah, once it's safe, we'll certainly start the famous Sunday hikes again. They they were the highlight of my week. But uh, we always do personal work, and and one of the, our therapists uh, is really he's a really uh, neat guy, really nice fellow, and um, he's both a therapist and you know working uh, in his in this in his system with uh, with with school children with uh, depression and anxiety. But he was all upset on this hike. He, he usually a real happy fellow and super athletic guy. He's done triathlons and stuff like that. And but he was practically in tears. And uh, he, he said he he thought he was a bad father. And he was kind of confessing this, and uh, and he was very upset, and he was just feeling feeling t totally down. And I, I said, well, wh why, why do you think you're a bad father? And then he explained that he'd, he'd yelled at his, at his sons. He'd gotten frustrated with them because they, they weren't doing their chores around the house, a not uncommon occurrence with teenagers. And yet he and his wife were sacrificing tremendously, doing all kinds of things for, for, the, for their sons, taking them on vacations to really educational and fun places and and sending them to you know costly fancy schools that they could you know barely afford and and that type of thing and he understandably got got annoyed and and kind of shouted at him and now this is a great example of emotional reasoning because you see he was feeling like a bad father right he was think he just felt like he was a horrible, bad hum human being. So he thought, oh, I must be, be a bad father. That, that's emotional reasoning. And the reason it, it's, I called it a cognitive distortion when I first created that list of 10 cognitive distortions way back in the uh, mid, mid to late 1970s is when that list was born. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it's, be, it's because the, the cognitive distortions are misleading. They get you believing horrible things that depress you that, that aren't true. And with him, the technique that helped was uh, simply uh, the, the, the Socratic technique. That's where you use uh, questioning to, to lead yourself or to lead a patient to the illogic of, of, of what they're, they're telling themselves. And so I said to him, so I guess what you're saying is if you do a, a, you know, a bad thing, like shouting at, at your sons, that, that makes you a bad father. Is that correct? And he says, yeah, that's, that sounds correct. And then I said, now, uh, do, do you ever do good things for your sons? And then he listed all these things that they're constantly wonderful things and you know, have wonderful times they have with their sons and all this stuff. So I said, so you do a lot of good things for your sons. He said, oh, yes, doctor, that's so true. And I said, so... So I guess what you're saying that when you do something bad, like shouting at your sons, that makes you a bad father, and then you're doing good things, so you're a good father. So are you telling me you're a good father and a bad father simultaneously? And then he suddenly <laughs> and then his thought head how exploded. illogical <laughs> the thing was, and he burst into laughter and his depression and disappeared. I said, instead of labeling yourself, uh, maybe we could talk about how you could deal with this with, with your sons and focus on a constructive solution rather than just beating up on yourself, which of course was easy. And, and we talked about how he could dialogue with his sons using the five secrets and sharing his feelings, both the love of them and, and the anger that he sometimes 
felt. And he came back to the hike the next week. He was just on top of the world, had the greatest exchange ever with, with his sons. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, being able to help people, get people out of these traps uh, is awesome. You had a I, great Yeah, I have example. an example too. <laughs> so I have a patient who's written a really great, a really, I've read parts of it, so I think it's really a brilliant book. And she was going to something called a pitch o rama It's kind of like speed dating where they have agents lined up in the room and you can spend five minutes with each agent, pitch your book, and then you know, pitch it to the next person, hoping, hoping that one of the agents would pick up your book. And before she, she was hesitating to sign up for it because she had so many negative thoughts and, about herself and her book. And, and just uh, her first negative thought, which was really the most challenging for her, was that, you know, I'm not very exciting enough for an agent to want to pick up my book. And, and you know, that led to her feeling inadequate and not good enough. And she saw when we went through the model and um, when we got through to the cognitive distortion step, she saw that that was emotional reasoning. I feel inadequate or I feel like I'm not very exciting. So I must not be very exciting. And um, we I actually- I feel inadequate, so I must be inadequate. I feel like a crappy writer, so I must be a crappy writer. Right. Yeah. I feel not exciting, so I must be very dull. Yeah, it's such a powerful thing because you we think I feel it, so it must be true. Right, and if you feel, and when she felt like I'm not very exciting, I must be dull. Then that behavior led to her not signing up for the pitcherama. Well, if I'm dull, no one's going to be interested in me, so I'm not going to sign up. So she cut herself yeah. off before she she even started. And um, we actually did the double standard technique because she's such a compassionate person. She can always show another person compassion and empathy like you do in the double standard technique. And she vent, she said to her friend, so you say to your friend, well, I'm really struggling with who's a clone of yours. As people know, um, the double standard technique, you say to your friend who's a clone of yours, gosh, I'm, I'm really struggling with this thought. I'm not very exciting. You know, I'm feeling really dull. And she, she said to her friend, well, that's not really true. You're, you're really an interesting person. And, um, you know, maybe sometimes you're quiet, but you have a lot to say and you're very interesting. And, and so then she was able to, to turn that thought toward herself. So uh, just to summarize here, uh, when, when she was telling herself, I'm not very interesting, she, she was being mean to herself and, uh, and saying things she would never say to another human being, someone that she just like her, who she re really loved and cared about. And so you asked her how she would talk to someone else. That's called the double standard technique. Treat all human beings with one standard rather than being kind to others and hostile to yourself. And what would you say to a dear friend? And then she was able to, to make the decision to talk to herself in that same, same kindly way. And, and you say it had a, a pretty immediate and powerful positive effect on her mood. It did. She was laugh. She started laughing, and um, you know, pretty much immediately changed her behavior, and she signed up for the Picho Rama. Yeah, that's awesome. How did it turn out? Do, you, do we know that yet, or I, we don't know that yet? No. Well, we wish her. We wish her the, the wish her the best. That's a good technique for emotional reasoning. The one I mentioned is kind of like examine the evidence is the one I used with the hiker. I thought he was a bad dad. What's the evidence you're a bad dad? What's the evidence you're, you're a good dad? Uh, as well as giving up the labeling, there are no good dads or bad dads or good moms or bad moms. All, we're all human and we all have strengths and, and, and weaknesses. And if there's a conflict with your sons, pinpoint that conflict and deal with it constructively, rather than pulling back and getting depressed and thinking you're some kind of terrible human being or, or, or terrible father. Uh, so that's another technique that, that can be helpful. For emotional reasoning, you see, when you reason from your emotions, I feel hopeless, so I must be hopeless. Uh, I feel anxious, so I must be in danger. Uh, I feel like a loser, so I must really be a loser. All of the truth-based techniques are good in addition to the ones we've already talked about that, you know, what's the evidence 
but for this? Or can I do an experiment to, to, to test this? So like if you feel hopeless, uh, you know, could you do an experiment to, to test that? Get work with the daily mood log and reading my book, Feeling Good, or the new one coming up, F Feeling Great, do, do the exercises, use the pleasure predicting sheet, the daily mood log, write down your thoughts, identify the distortions, and, and be measuring your mood and, and see if you can, in fact, uh, change, change the way you, th you think and feel. That would be using the experimental technique to, to test this belief uh, th that I'm hopeless because hopelessness is one of the most horrible emotions and it's always based on a distortion. It's the, it's the biggest fraud and con of all. And it's horrible because many people commit suicide or attempt suicide because they, they, they so strongly believe they're, they're hopeless. But there's, there's many, many ways to, uh, to challenge these, the, these distorted thoughts, including emotional reasoning. But the, the truth-based techniques, there's four survey technique. That's, that's where you ask uh, somebody uh, on the podcast. Uh, I've, I've mentioned a time I was alone in New York in a restaurant. I, w I got ticked off because I, I had this idea that they weren't going to treat me well because I was single. I, I had given a, a lecture that day and you know I wasn't with my wife. I was in New York. She was in Philadelphia. And the, the waiter seated me and I ordered this raw fish appetizer. I didn't know it was raw fish. I just, I saw it and it sounded good so I ordered it. It tasted, I didn't like the taste so I was just leaving it. And then a couple came in, sat next to me and they got served there right away, and I was still sitting there, you know, waiting for him to get rid of this caviche, I think it was called. Serviche. And, and, and I got really mad. I thought, that, that guy's just, he's just give, not giving me good service because I'm, I'm single, and I felt so angry. I thought, he must be screwing me over because I feel so angry. Mm. angry. You see, I, I was reasoning from, from my emotions, and, but then I, I used the survey t t technique, and I, I asked him, you know, if when my food would be coming along, and and he said, "Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I've been. I was wait, waiting for you to finish your appetizer." Mm. And I realized I just completely uh, misread the situation. Mind reading was another one of my distortions. But mm. to to get the the evidence and 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 check it out can be extremely important. I just want to mention, and this is right up your alley, uh, Rhonda, that. Emotional reasoning also uh, f uh, fuels uh, racial hatred, mm. bias, and, and discrimination. We, 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 we say to ourselves, oh my gosh, I think these black people are repulsive, or I think these Jewish people are somehow less than, or I, I think these uh, you know, Swedish people are, are kind of dumb and stupid. And, and so you feel morally superior that's a positive distortion. And then you think, well, it must be true mm -hmm. that black people or Jewish people or Swedish people or whatever, whoever you're targeting with, with your racial bias, you, you think that somehow it, it, it's correct. And Hitler capitalized on uh, positive emotional reasoning, telling people, you're the Aryan uh, people, you're superior to, to others. And this created mental excitement do you see? And so they're feeling, wow, we feel so superior. We feel like Superman, superwomen. We must really be superior. Mm. So it, this, this is really a, a tremendously important uh, one of the 10 cognitive distortions. And I would s s say perhaps the most overlooked distortion of all. I do agree with that. How, on a, you know, not you, you know, leading back to another, another component is that is there a, is there a place for self acceptance with emotional reasoning? It could be. I don't know quite what you're referring to, but you know, self acceptance is so huge and, and so important. How, what? How, how do you mean exactly? Well, like with my patient who said, "I'm not very exciting. I'm too dull." I mean, she got to a place where she said, "Well, I am shy and I don't speak up often," and sometimes oh, I, yeah. that can be interpreted as being dull. I mean, I think I'm yeah. interested, but you know, I am shy. Oh yeah, yeah. Just to to yeah. And any time you accept your specific flaws, there, there's no pain. It's only when we overgeneralize or label or go up into the clouds of abstraction that we feel the pain. Where we say, because I'm shy, I'm I'm therefore less of a human being. 
And, and that, that's where all the suffering comes. The problem is not the shyness ever, but the shame about, about the shyness and telling yourself that somehow you're, you're less than others because you're shy. Shyness without shame is not a problem. It's actually an asset because it allows you to get closer to people. To, you, you can share with them, gee, I, I get really shy and anxious sometimes and I'm feeling that way right now. And that all of a sudden that becomes an opportunity for 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 intimacy and for uh, love and greater greater closeness. Mm. So that that's a great point, Rhonda. Self acceptance is, I've often said, is the greatest change a human being can make. But we don't want to accept ourselves because it means accepting ourselves as lesser than, and we don't want to do that. We we're all trying trying to be special. Uh, but another thing I've often said is when you give up the need to be special. That's when life becomes special. I, well, I love that. I love that. I actually have that posted on my bulletin board. I look at that every day. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. And you've helped us a lot with that, like with yeah, your so have you. work on matter and antimatter. I don't matter. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it just, the recovery involves uh, understanding uh, spiritual paradoxes, understanding the concepts that the at the uh, essence of, of almost all, if not all, religions. And th that's why I love doing therapy, because I, I love seeing people recover really fast and completely, but also I love to see people catapulting into that dimension of, of enlightenment, because it, when the patient experiences such profound joy, I, I do too. I've, I'm babbling and I've said these things over and over again, so I better uh, shut No, up I think you're making figure. a really good point. We've people talked about figure out how demented I've really become, but no, no, no. Uh, I mean, you're making a good point because we've talked before too. Just summaries of a page of therapists getting um, burnt out. But one of the beautiful things about team therapy is that you see your patients, you know, you know, having a new thought. Like I, mean, I am a really interesting person, and then like bursting into tears with with love for themselves. And I mean, that sounds kind of hokey and dramatic, but that that happens and that feels good for the patient and it's rejuvenating for the therapist too. I love what you're saying. Yeah, I don't ever get burned out with team therapy. Never, ever. It's, it's it, uh, just the, the more I get of it, the more, the higher I get. It's, it's, it's when you have therapy that really works that you, you don't have to worry about getting burned out. If you have someone who's slow to respond or more challenging, it just makes it kind of more fun because to say, well, why is this person not responding really fast? And then you figure it out and then you have all of a sudden a, a new new understanding and, and, and new tools. But I think that for the most part, I'm not talking about schizophrenia or psychotic con conditions, but for the most part, I think that the treatment of depression and anxiety should be really, really fast. Uh, and. Uh, now it's something that drags on for for month, months or years with with little change. I, I that, that I do not like that at, at all. <laughs> That's one thing we know about you, David. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you don't like therapy that drags on and on for years and years. Did you get that idea? <laughs> well, thank you. We better better I better shut up here and let people get back to their lives. But thank you all for joining us today. We we just love it when you tune in and when you write in your ideas and thoughts and sometimes you criticize us and when you do, you've always got great points to make and a lot of times you 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 praise us and we we sure appreciate that too. Yes, thank you everyone for listening until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye, Rhonda. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.